Today's species spotlight is on a species of North American colubrid that has been around for a very long time, but we just don't really see too much. And that's probably because there aren't any morphs on it. This is the Arizona mountain king snake. This is one of those old school colubrids. So these guys obviously get their name from the Arizona mountain range where a good majority of them are found. However, there are a few different disjointed habitats where they are found outside of the Arizona kind of mountain range where we're talking about, um, as far east as parts of New Mexico and in other parts of Utah and some other places as well. Now, these guys are really, really cool. Sometimes they're actually called pyro king snakes, and that's because of their actual Latin species name, and that is pyromelena. So I'm pretty sure I said that right, as always. There's the Latin name. So pyro, Latin fire, melana means black, essentially. So for instance, um, when we talk about the Pituophis melanolucus of the uh, northern pine snake, the melana is the black part, lucus is the white part, black and white because it's a black and white snake. The Arizona mountain king snake, pyro, melana, fire, black. So the black and like it's fiery black and red kind of a deal. So these guys, as I said before, really, really cool. They're still part of the Lampropeltis genus or the essentially family that makes up, not the family, because that's a different thing, but so, you know, it's the species is pyromelana, genus is lampropeltris, that's what almost every single king snake and milk snake is part of. However, they are not part of the same species that are the Mexican black king snakes, the gray banded king snakes, or the California king snakes, ones that you probably are more likely to have heard of, especially if you have only really just recently gotten into this hobby. These guys are entirely different species, but still lampropeltis. In Latin, the lampropeltis basically means shield belly, because if you look at the underside of their belly, whereas compared to most of the rest of them, is very high shiny and has lots of iridescence. So, as I said before, really cool snake. I think the count's up to like four at this point. These guys are typically found in kind of rocky, arid, desert-like, evergreen uh, forest to where, so when we think of the mountains of Arizona, it's not just cactus and yucca plants. There are quite a few different bits of vegetation as well. And these guys are often found at night versus in kind of like the early dawn dusk hours into the beginning of night, like many other species of snakes that are a little bit more crepuscular, meaning active at dawn and dusk, where a lot of times reptiles, specifically snakes, um, because more lizards are diurnal, um, they will come out right as the sun is setting to get a little bit of that residual warmth and ultraviolet light from the setting sun. And then they will start and hunt for the first few hours into darkness. And then sometimes they'll be active in the morning before it starts to get very bright and hot. These guys are very often found, usually by herpers, but other scientists and research as well, usually kind of in the middle of the night, either via by road cruising or by walking around in the middle of the desert at night, regardless of how out of context safe that sounds. They're a fairly small king snake, where typically they usually stay right around that three foot range, and they're still very slender bodied like most king snakes as well. There have been a couple recorded that have gotten close to four feet, but overall they're a little bit smaller of an animal. And these guys, when you go out and are looking for these guys, you think they'd be really easy to find, but during the day they're almost always tucked away either under fallen logs, in old rodent burrows or under rocks or in like the rock shelves where a big part of their natural landscape is. So it becomes fairly difficult to actually find them in their natural range other than as previously stated via road cruising or walking around in the middle of the night um, and hoping to come across one because otherwise in the middle of the day you're probably not going to find one unless you're sitting there flipping rocks for hours and hours and hours. Um, these guys are typically found at fairly high elevations as well. That's that mountain part. Now, being in Colorado, none of that seems very high, but when compared to a lot of other species of snakes that are often found in more swampy or plains or grassland areas, these guys are found in elevations of anywhere between 3,000 and 9,000 feet, which for anyone outside of the U.S., that is anywhere from 900 to about 2,700 meters. So that's a decent elevation. That's also somewhere in the range where we've seen like the... Russian rat snakes, and a couple other different more mountain cooler weather species, although these guys definitely aren't a real cool weather one. In captivity, they are fairly simple to keep, and in fact, they're one of the more simple species of king snakes in general. They're usually kept very successfully by keeping them kind of warm, relatively dry, and plenty of places to keep them. So 
being a smaller snake, you don't necessarily need to have as large of an enclosure as you would for like the Mexican black king snakes or the California king snakes that can get a little bit larger as a whole. They seem to do very well with nighttime temperature drops, which makes sense considering when they're really active. So during the summer months when they would be active and they would go through a period of brumation in the wintertime, because even in the mountains of Arizona, it does snow. Um, it's very hot during the day and it can get very cold, sometimes closer towards the morning around like, you know, that two, three, four o'clock in the morning. And they're really active in the earlier part of that nighttime period when it's a little bit cooler. So that makes sense that if you want to actually keep them in captivity, those warmer spots during the day in that like 80 to 85 ish range, maybe a little bit warmer for a hot spot. And then a nighttime drop when they would be a little bit more active of five to 10 degrees. A lot of people seem to have great success in keeping that way. These guys are, as I said before, a very simple species to keep as far as husbandry goes. And as far as king snake goes, they can be fairly flighty, but they're not nearly as inclined to bite as some other species, like a lot of the Eastern Kings of the Florida King snakes or something like that. And not to say that they are very bitey animals at all, even the Eastern and Florida Kings, they just are much more inclined to run and try to get away than they are to turn back around on you, which makes a really good captive pet for someone very first getting started, or you just want something that's a little bit different like myself. All the video that you've seen so far today is actually of my friends Braden Exotics, uh, Pyro King Snake, or the Arizona Mountain King Snake. I've just been calling them Pyros because uh, when I very first got started in this, I was learning from an old school guy, and that's what he called them. Um, they would actually do really, really cool, and I would love to be able to do this if I got a hold of one one of these days, is set it up in a really nice, like, naturalistic looking enclosure with both a really cool 3D printed background background with a lot of rock ledges for them to squeeze in and under and perch as well as lots of other um, actual natural rock as well. Um, I have successfully actually done more of an arid semi-bioactive setup with uh, a more arid tolerant species of isopod which would be kind of cool and I could get like agave and yucca plants in there and I think that would look really cool for that Arizona mountain king snake semi-bioactive because it's not truly um, more naturalistic kind of really cool arid desert setup. I would love to be able to do that as I'm moving further and further away from the smaller racks. These guys are some of the racks, the only racks that I really use anymore outside of the baby ones. Um, as I move towards more actual larger enclosures for a lot of different species that I keep, I'd love to be able to do something really cool like that for the Arizona mountain king snake. Now, as I've said, at least point probably three times, they are a very simple species to keep. However, I've been told anecdotally by more than one king snake breeder that the hatchlings can be a little bit difficult to get going. In the wild, they are natural lizard eaters, especially as babies, as well as they'll also eat other small snakes like worm snakes or longnose snakes and things like that. Um, and as they get older, their diet starts to vary out into a more, again, plenty of species of uh, snake because they're king snakes, lizards, and other ground nesting birds and mammals. As hatchlings, they seem to really want to favor the lizards thing. So a lot of scenting techniques, which is used to use one prey item to kind of scent the other one has been used not only very successfully for the Arizona mountain king snake hatchlings, but other ones as well, like the gray banded king snakes and even corn snake hatchlings. A lot of corn snakes can sometimes have a lot of difficulty and there are a lot of really fun, crazy techniques that are used from scenting with lizards and like anoles, um, frogs and frog legs. And um, they'll even use like green tree frogs and stuff like that. to once they get established eating uh, rodents very successfully, they're usually a much more stable animal. And as adults, varying up their diet with maybe feeder anoles or using reptilinks or something like that would be a really cool and I imagine a very healthy idea for your adult animals for long-term happy healthy captive lives. Although I know plenty of people that have kept their Arizona Mountain Kings. I shouldn't say plenty of people. I only know about four people that actually work with them and have regularly and successfully for extended periods of time for well over 20 years. So they are keeping them very well on strictly rodent diets. However, always want to try to recreate as much as we can naturally in a safe captive setting. Hopefully you guys enjoyed today's video. It's a little bit shorter than usual. Um, big thanks to Braden Exotics for letting me film some of their animals again. Um, if you guys want to check out another playlist of a full thing of species spotlights where I talk about a lot of different species, mostly snakes, but I'm branching out there. Um, there are a few different lizards and uh, tortoises in there as well. Uh, if you want to check that playlist out, it helps my click-through rate, let YouTube know that I still exist. If you can like and subscribe, that really, really helps me out I'm trying to do this full-time, trying to be a nice full-time content creator, animal advocate, and educator, and all that good jazz. Again, hopefully you enjoyed today's video. Hope you're having a great day, and we'll check you next time.